Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. And beginning in verse 13. As you turn there, I'm almost done with what to look for for the signs that I'm going to be giving you when, before we enter chapter 2. And so uh, keep that in prayer. As we, before I begin chapter 2, I'm going to give you all the signs and keep you up to date what's going on now. And then uh, you'll see that from chapter 2 on, we'll be going through all those signs. And so it, we're, we are living in exciting times, amen? amen. So uh, it's going to, be, going to be fun preaching it. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they had burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Father God, we just thank you for the time we could spend in your word this morning. And Lord, as we pray, we pray that your word will come alive. Holy Spirit, God, and direct. And Lord, I especially pray for those, Lord, that we have many that are still sick, have colds and flus and our home today, and I pray, Father, that they receive a touch of the Master's hand today. Be with them, and Father, I pray uh, as we look at the Word today, speak to our hearts, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in verse 13, we see that Jesus, the Bible says, He was like unto the Son of Man. See those words? <coughs> the Son of Man. Of man, this is talking. This is not talking about deity here. We realize that Jesus is God, but every time you see the word "son of God," it's talking about the human side of Him, being born, living, being amongst men as a man. And so, he's notice here it says, "Like unto the Son of Man," verse thirteen. This is a title that Jesus frequently used of himself in scripture. For instance, look at, turn to Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9. And notice verse number 6. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thy house. See the terminology? The Son of Man. And by the way, he's the only man that forgives sins, amen? Yes. No priest can forgive sins. There are certain religions that a man says he can forgive your sin. No, he can't. There's only one person in Scripture that can forgive sins, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. In Him, the Bible says, is the forgiveness of sins. So don't come to me confessing your sins. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> i got enough problems with my own sin. Amen. <laughs> I don't need to hear from you. So uh, notice the term, though, Son of Man. He said the same thing. Look at chapter 10 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verse 23. But when they persuade you in the city, flee you into the, another, for verily say unto you, you shall not have done on the cities of Israel till the Son of Man come. Matthew chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, verse 8, chapter 13, verse 37, Matthew 18, verse 11. You see all these terms titled, the Son of Man. It's talking about his ministry here on earth as a man. And so you'll see that title uh, frequently in the scriptures. So that's very important. I want you to notice, though, this is the same title that the prophet Daniel gave to the Messiah 
in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, compared with Matthew 26, verse 64, even Daniel, the prophet of old, used that terminology, the Son of Man is coming as the Messiah. So really the Jewish nation and the Jewish people had no excuse whatsoever. Uh, the, it was taught from them through all the prophets that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who was going to be born in Bethlehem, will come one day. Amen. And he came that day 2,000 years ago when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And so he did come as prophesied. But what's it, I want you to notice some interesting things here this morning in verse 13 with that title, the Son of Man. This reminds us of several truths concerning this title. The first truth concerning the title of the Son of Man is this. Christ being the Son of Man reminds us God's Son became a man. Amen? In John chapter 1, turn over there. In John chapter 1, and notice verse 1. John chapter 1, I want you to notice verse 1. In the beginning was the word. word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pop down to verse 14. And the Word, that's the same word used in verse 1. See that? Was made what? Flesh. There it is. Was the Word became flesh dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there it is. The Son of Man became flesh. He is God in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Turn over there. Hebrews chapter 2, and verse number 14. The Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He, that's Christ, also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil. And so we see here, one of the titles of Son of God reminds us that Jesus Christ, as the Son of Man, became a man. And He was the Son of God. Amen? Secondly, that title, Christ being the Son of God, also speaks of Christ's love and His willingness to take sinful man's place in judgment. Do you realize that this morning, if you're not saved this morning, Jesus Christ came and, and, and came in the flesh so that He would die for your sin and mine? That He would take our judgment upon His body on Calvary. What a Savior, amen? amen? Do you realize He did that for you? He did that for me? He did not have to. But He did it willingly. Yes, He became, as the Son of Man, He, he became our place in judgment. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 for a second. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse number 21, wonderful scripture. For he, that's Christ, watch this. For he hath made him to be sin. What's the next two words? For us. For you, for me. Who knew no sin. That's right. He was God in the flesh. Jesus Christ was sinless. He, he didn't know it was like to sin. Strange he wanted to die for sinners like you and me, huh? that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. See, the Bible says there's none not righteous. There's not one person on planet Earth that's righteous. Not one. So all these religions that teach you, oh, just be a good person, you know, get baptized, join a church, be kind to your neighbor, all that, you're trying to work your own righteousness before God, which you cannot do. Because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have what? Sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter how good you are, you still are short in God's sight because you are born in sin. Pastor, I'm not born in sin. Yes, you are. Because the Bible says, for the wage of sin is yes. death. That's why you die. That's why we die, because of sin. If you're saying you're not a sinner, then you're saying you're never going to die. Friend, you are going to die one day. And the only way you're going to be righteous before God is not through a religion, it's through a relationship. 
with Jesus Christ. Did you catch that in verse 21? He, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we by the rights of God in Him, we were only righteous in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's it. You want righteousness, you're going to have to repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Then you'll become righteous before God. Why? Because God sees Jesus in you. Amen? Amen? And that's how we become righteous. There's nothing we've done. Amen? So if you think joining a Baptist church is going to get you to heaven, it eh, ain't going to work. No way. See, I want to shock some people this morning. God's not a Baptist. God's not a Roman Catholic. God's not a Presbyterian. God's not a Methodist. God's not an Episcopalian. Don't put God in that category. God is not the author of religion. God is the author of a relationship in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's it, people. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? Man, if God was a Baptist, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble. What am I saying this morning? As the Son of Man, His body was placed on a cross, shed His blood, so that you and I would be spared the judgment day. Everyone in this room, if you're not saved, if you don't know Christ, you are going to stand before the great white throne judgment and give an account for every word you've said, every sin you've done. And what are you going to do then? Because then it's too late. I like that song. You ever heard that song, It's Too Late? See, Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Your preparation for heaven is now, not after you die. Now is the time you have to make an eternal decision where you're going to spend eternity. You have to make that choice this morning before you die. Because after death, it's a point of the man wants to die. After this, the judgment. It's all over once you die. <clears throat> you can't say to God, oh, I want to make it up. Oh, give me a second. There's no second chance after death. Your opportunity is now. The Bible says, for now is the accepted day. Now is the day of salvation. Now. So please, this morning, if you're not saved, we're giving the invitation, come and make the greatest Choice of your life. Meeting Jesus Christ as your Savior. It doesn't get any better than that. Also, thirdly, the Christ being the Son of Man reminds us that the rule of the kingdom of God has been given to a man, and Christ is that man. Yes, there is the kingdom of God, amen? And Jesus Christ is the head of that kingdom. As a matter of fact, when you get, if you get saved this morning and become born again, you become part of the family of God and the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. You see, in order to be in the kingdom of God, you've got to know the king. Amen? Amen? Oh, there's much philosophy going around today. We're all children of God. No, you're not. We're all in the kingdom of God. No, you're not. That is, if you believe the Bible... For the Bible says in John 1, 12, but to as many as receive him, to then gave he them the what power to become the sons of God. You're only a child of God when you receive Christ. Amen. Then you enter his kingdom. But you've got to meet the king first. Do you know the king? Amen. I hope you do. Because you know what? He is coming one day. Amen. Whether you believe it or not. The one thing I'm sure of, my Lord does not lie. The Bible says all men are liars. Jesus Christ speaks what? The truth. And Jesus says, I am coming again. And I will 
receive you unto myself. Are you ready for him? I hope so. Also, the title Son of Man also reminds us that all salvation is through this man. The Son of Man. Look at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Beginning in verse 5. Well, we'll start at verse 4. He says, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Watch this verse very closely. For there is one God and one... What's a mediator? A go-between. How many religions today have many mediators to get to God? There's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ, Jesus. People, it doesn't get any plainer than that. Who gave himself a ransom, verse 6, for all to be testified in due time. There's only one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Catch that term, the man, that's the son of man. That's his title. There's no greater mediator than Jesus Christ. Because it's through him that salvation. Christ is risen from the dead, glorified the son of God. So you better take heed this morning, amen, to who he is and what he said to do to meet him. Once again, it's not through a religion. It's through a relationship. Do you know Jesus Christ personally, intimately? You can, amen? amen. What joy there is knowing Jesus amen. and making peace with God. You see, people, you're not going to find peace out there in the world. There's only one way you're going to find peace, and that's through Jesus Christ, amen? Who is the Prince of Peace? You're not going to find it in work. You're not going to find it in money. You're not going to find it in drugs. You're not going to find it in alcohol. See, all those things are temporary. They come and they go. They last for a while, then they go. They give you a buzz, and then they go. If you want a buzz that lasts forever, then get hooked on Jesus Christ. Ask Him to come into your heart. And man... You'll have the greatest joy and peace you'll always experience all your life. Amen? Amen. And, and what's best about that, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or what? Forsake, Forsake you. He's there. Because that stuff out there is temporary. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. Yeah, high one day, low the next. <laughs> but with Jesus, it's a consistent, permanent peace and joy. Yes. Amen? Through all trials and tribulations, He's there to comfort you, guide you, and get you through it. Amen? Amen. Where the world, they're friendly one day, and they're mean the next. Come to Christ this morning, as He's the Son of Man that knows you, loves you, and will take care of you. Notice also in our text in verse 13, He, he was clothed with a garment down to his foot. Hmm. Now that's interesting. You see, the long garment here speaks of dignity and royalty. It's a garment that the priest wore in the Old Testament time during the tabernacle. A priest wore a garment and also usually the king of a country wore a garment and a crown. So it was a sign of dignity and royalty. Hmm. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, notice what the scripture says here. You see, Jesus Christ is our high priest. He wore uh, a robe also. 
The high priest in the Old Testament wore a robe as he entered the tabernacle in Exodus 28, verses 31 to 33. And Christ is our high priest. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 says, We're unto in all things that behoove him to be like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation of the sins of the people. Isn't that a wonderful thing? A born-again believer who knows Jesus Christ, you have your own personal priest. You know who that is? Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. You don't need a guy in a black suit and a white tie and a white collar. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of the tribe of Moses, spake nothing concerning the priesthood. When you read on further down that chapter, it talks about Jesus Christ being our great high priest. In Hebrews chapter 5, in verse number 5, look at that one. Hebrews chapter 5, and verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that saith unto him, Thou art my son today, have I begotten thee. So you put all these scriptures together, Jesus Christ is our high priest. That's why it says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 13, that's why there, there's a robe there, that's why there's a garment there. Jesus Christ is deity. He's all authority. And he wears that garment Proudly. So praise the Lord, we have a high priest that loves us and takes care of us. Also, here's a point to think to remember too that the long garment speaks also of modesty here. Christ is not a rapper. <laughs> I get so upset when I see these people talk about Jesus Christ as a rapper. He's not a rapper, he's not a beach bum. He wears a robe of royalty, of dignity. Amen? Yeah. Jesus is Lord. He's king. He loves you and I. He died for us. He, ne he never partied down with sinners. The average non-church goer thinks Jesus is cool. But his church is not. I was watching a program one day and all these people said, oh, Jesus is, he's good, he's cool. I'm watching it. And the guy made this statement, quote, Jesus is a party dude. Huh? Are you kidding me? I'm thinking, what's that guy smoking? <laughs> Jesus a party dude? One person put it this way in that same documentary. Jesus is gracious and fun to hang out with who will party with us and won't even oppose it. That's not the Jesus Christ I know. He's holy and harmless and undefiled. He's the holy, sinless Son of God. Amen? He's not some party dude. He's not the, quote, man upstairs. Give me a living break. I'm going to tell you something. If, ever, if God decided to show himself right here, and the next minute, everyone would be on their knees saying, Holy, holy, holy. They wouldn't say, Hey, there's the dude. Listen, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Hmm. When you see people acting like that and describing our Lord like that, this isn't, the, this isn't the Jesus of the Bible that I know of. He's not some cool guy to party with. Jesus is Lord, King of kings, and Lord of lords. And here's the point to ponder here. Notice verse 13 also says, He was girt about with paps with a golden girdle. Verse 13, see that? Paps and golden girdle. Paps are the breasts, so Jesus, uh, of the, the priest's outfit, 
the paps were the breast part that he wore. And what, what you see here, so Jesus had a golden girdle that encircled his chest. The girdle signifies many things in the Bible. Uh, John chapter 13, you have to turn there, verse 4 and 5, suggests servanthood. The, the girdle also uh, describes warfare in 2 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 8. And this is what I want you to ponder this morning. In this case, in this scripture, the girdle signifies Christ the high as the high priesthood in Exodus chapter 28. The high priest's ephod, girdle, and breastplate were all connected together and placed over his breast, over his chest. The ephod was brought uh, from behind the neck, hung over the shoulders, and covered the breast, and the girdle came across the stomach around his waist. So, no, so what they're describing here about our Lord is this. The Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest, and John saw him dressed as such in this verse. He saw Jesus Christ and all the gold, all the deity, all the splendor as the great high priest of heaven. In other words, we as born-again believers have the same robes of righteousness provided by Jesus Christ. Amen? When we all get to heaven, those that are born again, we're going to be wearing the same robes because we are wrapped up all in Him. Amen? Amen. Revelation 4.4 4 will tell you that. Revelation 7.9 and Revelation 19.8. And so what you have here, John is describing a very precious event here. That Jesus Christ is deity, deserves all glory and honor. Amen. Amen. Notice his head. Verse 14, and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow in verse 14. Now, Daniel describes this same picture in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Here, Daniel describes the exact same thing as Jesus establishes his kingdom. The white hair in Scripture always speaks of old age. Yeah, so you got white hair, guess what? You're old. <laughs> speaks of old age. Isaiah 46, 4 will tell you that. Proverbs 16, 31 will tell you that, and Micah 5, 2. Jesus, with white hair, is speaking of here as the eternal Son of God because the Bible says He's going forth from old to old. He's forever. He's forever. Christ, the Bible says, is of the ancient days of old. So it's describing him as the eternal God. That's what you have here in this verse. White hair also, according to Isaiah 118, speaks of righteousness. White hair speaks of judgment, Daniel 7. And the same is said of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 1 as he judges the, uh, those uh, churches in Revelation chapter 2 when we get there. So in other words, his head and his hair were like wool, as white as snow. So Jesus Christ also is the judge of the entire world. And you're going to see that judgment when we get to chapter 6, all the way to chapter 19 in Revelation. You'll see him as an ancient judge, judging all through chapter 6, all the way to chapter 19. You see nothing but the judgment of Jesus Christ falling upon the world, falling upon nations after nations. And when we get to those verses, you think it's bad now? It's going to get worse. Once the church is taken up, that one world dictator rules the whole world. You haven't seen nothing yet. And we're close to that. Notice in verse 14, his eyes were a flame of fire. This signifies Christ's omniscience. It signifies his piercing, penetrating, perfect knowledge and through insight into all persons and, and all things. Notice Revelation chapter 19. I'll turn over there a minute. Revelation chapter 19. I want you to notice verse 12. 
Revelation 19, and notice verse number 12. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. His eyes were a flame of what? Fire. Fire. So what he's talking about here, judgment. Anytime you see fire in the scriptures, it's talking about judgment. He not only sees all things, but also the judge of all things he sees. There is no court of appeal or higher authority than Jesus Christ. So in other words, as, as he, his eyes look over and watches every human being, do you actually think that you and I can, get, can hide things from him? Do you actually think you can get away with it? Man, mankind is fickle, aren't they? They actually think they can hide anything from an almighty, all-knowing God. And they'll run into a cave here, or they'll try to run here, they'll try to run yonder, and they'll say, okay, God won't see this. Oh, my friend, don't be fooled. God sees everything. Do you realize this morning, the scripture teaches that when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, every action you did, every word you said will be played back to you. God's watching everything we do. You say, well, that's not fair. Take it up with him. And so you might think you're getting away with it today. But God is keeping a book and writing down everything you've done, everything I've done. But praise God, when you get saved, guess what happens? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from what? All the, our sins past, present, future are totally forgiven. Whew. Thank you, Lord. But remember, he's watching everything. The, the psalmist, look at, look at Psalm 139. I love the way this, the psalm, David, I love how he described the omniscience of God and knowing everything. Psalm 139. Notice what he says here. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting, mm -hmm. mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought of heart. You, wow. What are you thinking right now? What's going through your mind right now? God already knows. You, you, your thought process, even God knows. Thou compasseth my path, my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it, what? All together. And he says, verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain unto it. Yeah, well, I, I can't either. So you, even your thought process, God knows. So be careful, my friends, this morning. The piercing eyes of Jesus Christ and the fiery eyes, and, and the, they are looking upon you tonight, this morning. And what are you going to do about it? Verse 8, uh, verse 15, His feet lack unto brass as if they burn in a furnace. That is, His feet were so bright that they seemed to be like a beautiful metal glowing Intensely in a furnace. That's how John saw it. You see, brass signifies strength in Scripture. Whenever Christ walks, whatever he does is done according to divine power. Brass burned up in a furnace signifies God's judgment upon sin and his atonement thereof. The altar of sacrifice was made of brass, remember? And the labor was made of brass. 
which means that the judgment fell upon Christ for our sins, thereby signifying the washing of sin on the basis of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Aren't you glad this morning that his sacrifice on Calvary washed away our sins? Amen? In other words, our judgment fell upon him. And when he said it was finished, praise God, it was finished. In other words, God looked down and said, I am well pleased with that sacrifice. And praise God, three days later, he rose again from the dead. Amen. Amen. So his feet were like brass, and they burn in a furnace brightly. Christ's feet are brass signifies the day is coming when he shall put his feet down on everything contrary to truth and righteousness. Everything unholy will be stamped out by the divine judgment. So there is a bright day coming. Amen? When Jesus, we'll see in Revelation, puts his two feet on the Mount of Olives, and when he puts his feet down, praise God things will start to look brighter. And then his voice was as a sound of many waters, verse 15. This speaks of the power and majesty of God's word. It has been said that the sound of Niagara Falls can be heard 50 miles away. I can testify to that. We went to Niagara Falls years ago. I remember before we walked, got close to the falls, you could hear that noise miles away. And then when we got there, of course, <laughs> it was really loud. The thundering noise of God's word is very, very powerful. This book is the truth. Whether you believe it or not, this book is the truth. This book has powerful truth. It has such power that it can change your life if you'll read it. And get to know the author of it. Amen? Amen? There's no greater book than the scriptures. Amen? Now, I like books. I have books. I have a 3,000 volume library. I like reading books. But this is my main book. This is the one I treasure. This is the one that will always tell me the truth. Whether I like to hear it or not. <laughs> because the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, this is a two-edged sword, right? And it does divide. It does pierce the heart. But that's okay. Because if you open your heart to the truth of this book, it'll change you. Oh, if nations and people would obey the principle of this book, it'd be a much brighter world. Amen. But you see, the Bible says men love darkness rather than the light. It's sad to say mankind loves their sin more than the Savior who loved and died for them. Get, get, get into the Word of God. It's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Get to know the book. Read it. I challenge you to read it. You say, well, I can't understand it. Well, if you come to know Jesus Christ, you'll understand it. Listen to the voice of God. See, we have the very word of God today in Scripture. It has the power to raise the dead to spiritual life and build up the saints in the faith. Amen? It builds us up. The word of God should be proclaimed so loudly that it is heard by all men today. By all men today. And then, lastly, you notice verse 20. He had in his right hand seven stars. Hmm. These are the angels of the seven churches. The word angel here means messenger. Messenger. And, th and these could be either heavenly angelic messengers or human messengers. I believe, and this is me, 
I believe they were not angels but human messengers. Probably the pastors or the elders of the seven churches that are assigned to the task. Uh, no, if you want to believe that they are angels, that's up to you. That's fine. You, you have a right to believe that, and that's not a hill to die on. But I believe these were the messengers, the pastors of the seven churches that John was given the message to. And I, and, and I believe the following reasons why I believe the angels here refer to human messengers rather than an angel. I'll just give you one, and we'll go over the rest of it next Sunday morning. You see, the Bible says in the following passages, the same Greek word translated angel, angelos, refers to men, not angels. It refers to men. Matthew 11.10, Mark 1.2, Luke 7.24. I could go on and on. You'll see the word messenger there, and it means human messenger. It doesn't mean angelic beings. Every time you see uh, the Apostle Paul writing an epistle, it wasn't an angel writing the epistle. It was a human being writing the epistles. Also, John wrote to these messengers, no other case in the Bible do we find men writing to angels. angels. You won't find it nowhere. So these aren't angels. Well, nowhere in the scriptures do you find men writing to angels. Nowhere from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus gave the revelation by an angel by his angel, Revelation 22, 16, if these were heavenly angels, it would mean that a heavenly angel wrote to other heavenly angels, which is, that's not even preferred in Scripture. I'll give you more reasons next week. The point I want to make this morning is this. You've seen a description of Jesus Christ this morning as the Son of Man. And what he's done for you. Do you know the Son of Man this morning? If you die today, you do not want to meet Jesus Christ with his fiery eyes. You want to meet him with the compassionate eyes that were at Calvary, that said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You want to meet Jesus, the Savior, the one who died for your sin and for mine. That's the one you want to meet. Amen? Amen. Consider this morning your spirituality. Consider your soul this morning. For the world says, get all the gusto you can get. Eat, drink, be merry. Yet Jesus said, what's the profit? A man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Your soul is important to Jesus Christ. Do you realize this morning, if you would have been the only person born on earth, Jesus would have come and died just for you. Thank you, Lord. It's your decision this morning. How are you going to meet Jesus when you die? How are you going to meet him? As a friend or as a foe? It's up to you. Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin. I did not deserve it. But Father... I thank you for the grace of God. Thank you that one day you came across my path and saved my soul through your son, Jesus Christ. And as we give the invitation, I pray this morning, Father, there's that one soul that's really thinking of their eternal destiny. May they come. And I'll take out a Bible and show them how they can know Jesus personally. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.